should still feel very nice. Tunis is good, 19 Celsius, quite bright and dry, the whole of Egypt enjoying a glorious day. And again, those temperatures dropping back from the unusual extremes we've seen of late, 26 in Luxor, 19 Celsius, the max in Cairo. On the other side of North Africa, another great day in the Moroccan beach resort of Agadir, 26 Celsius, the forecast high, 25 inland in Marrakesh, where the sun will soon deal with any morning mistiness. Across in the Canary Islands, we've got a fair amount of cloud coming and going, but all the resort should manage a few good sunny breaks. It's in the low 20s Celsius throughout, light winds too, which is always a bonus. Transatlantic to the southern US now, and it's basically dry and mostly fine. Temperatures really on the up across Florida now. In Orlando, it might not be exactly unbroken sunshine, but the Saturday max is 30 Celsius. Not even the Keys and Miami can quite match that, although there is probably more in the way of sun towards the south of Florida. As for Mexico, we're looking at a temperature range 24 Celsius up in the central mountains, more like 30, and the rest in the beach resorts on the Pacific and the Yucatan. Take a look at this preview of Saturday in Cancun. And finally, the Caribbean, dry, hot and fine. That's everything you could ask and more. Just remember the high factor sunblock though, the UV risk is extremely high. This is the Travel Channel. At 8.30, hit the road for cool scenery and unforgettable people on treks in a wild world through Colorado. First to Edinburgh with the travel bug. <laughs> Today, the sound of the pipes beckons the travel bug to the capital of Scotland, Edinburgh. We go the whole hog down the Royal Mile from the castle on the mound to Holyrood House. Take a look at kinky kilts for the 21st century and get stuck into the best of Scottish food. Edinburgh's got to be one of the most spectacular capital cities in the world. Built on top of a load of extinct volcanoes, it's got this great brooding castle stuck right in the middle of it. But it's forever being compared to its groovy neighbour Glasgow. And it does have this image of being less hip, less happening and a tad more snooty. The sort of place where sex is something they put coal in. Teetering on Northwest Europe's final frontier, the Scottish capital can be accused of being remote and inaccessible, but ironically, it's right at the heart of European cultural life. Every August, thousands of the coolest people around flock here for the world's biggest cultural jamboree, that famous festival, or rather five festivals rolled into one. It's definitely not the weather that brings them, which can be as dour as a Scott banker at any time of the year. So Edinburgh's a bit schizophrenic, cool and cultured, but conservative at the same time. Even the city itself is split down the middle. Up there, you've got the old town with its moody medieval alleyways, while down here, there's the new town, all gorgeous Georgian squares and elegant avenues. The Edinburgh of Miss Jean Brodie. So it's no surprise to discover that Robert Louis Stevenson wrote about literature's most famous schizo here. His story of Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde was based on local Deacon Brodie, who by day lived in this close and was a respected counsellor, and by night was a ruthless robber, and now has ended up as a themed bistro. It's also the place where Irvin Welsh set his druggy contemporary classic, Train Spotting. But there's no need to be in two minds about how it looks. Architecturally, Edinburgh's a peach. They don't call it the Athens of the North for nothing. And there aren't many cities that can boast a stretch of wilderness where you can go horse riding, rock climbing, or just push little Johnny around in a buggy with a totally bazzing view. This is Arthur's seat. No one's really certain why it's called that. I mean, it's not as if there's a dodgy bench with a plaque or anything. It's just another one of those extinct volcanoes. And quite honestly, when the chill Edinburgh wind starts to blow, you'd wish it was a bit more active. But whichever angle you look at it from, even after 1,100 years, Edinburgh's castle is its most awesome sight. Wherever you go in the city, you turn a corner and there it is looming over you. It's not what you call pretty, and in fact, when the mist swirls around it, sometimes it can look quite scary. The climb up's a bit of a bummer. In fact, the whole city is something of an aerobic challenge. So take care if you've got wee-ins. When I brought mine here, they moaned a lot about all the mountaineering they had to do. Whew. This is Scotland's number one tourist attraction, and there's loads of stuff to see, from the Scottish Crown jewels to instruments of torture. 
It is good value for money, but where you do pay a price is it's always incredibly busy. Here at Millsmount Battery, you get to take part in one of Edinburgh's most famous rituals. And if it's your first time, you'll need to have these at the ready. The one o'clock gun was originally set off to let the boats in the Firth of Forth know that uh, it's one o'clock. Now it's a tourist fixture. This is the oldest bit of the castle, the sweet little Norman church of St Margaret's, built by the saint herself when she was just a plain old queen. A non-queeny queen, though. Every day she fed 300 beggars at the palace gates. Getting a cup of tea in Asana is probably more difficult nowadays because although they've got two cafes here, there are so many visitors in the summer that they're both heavily oversubscribed. The Scottish crown jewels are here, including the Stone of Destiny, where kings were crowned from the 9th century. That is until Edward I nicked it and took it to Westminster. A group of Scottish students pinched the stone back again in the 1950s. The government weren't amused and yanked it down to London. It was finally returned in 1996 by a Tory government desperate for a good bit of PR north of the border. But the joke is the smart money says it's actually a fake, that it is in fact a 10th century cover for a septic tank. Leading down from the castle to the Palace of Holyrood is Edinburgh's most famous street, the Royal Mile. Yes, it is a mile long and en route you get a flavour of what a chaotic place this must have been in the 17th and 18th centuries with its winding alleys and towering tenements. It's hard to imagine that this incredibly smart street once flowed with sewage and that these tenement buildings had the filthy masses cheek by jowl with the rich and famous. So Dr Johnson's Boswell, who was a regular visitor, could have stayed above Mrs McMucker and her 12 diseased kiddies. Mind you, in those days, the posh classes were literally the stinking rich. Along the mile, there's plenty to tempt the unwary tourist, all those rotten retail opportunities that leave your suitcase bursting with tat. But there's the odd diamond amongst the doggy doo. The Hub is the new permanent home of the Edinburgh Festival. And though the gig itself is only on in August, this place is open all year round with shows and regular art exhibitions. Even if you've got no intention of ever buying a ticket to the festival, this is a good place to come for a bite to eat and a wander round. And if you get lucky in the cafe, you can even get married here. Of course, it's impolite to come to Edinburgh without tasting a dram of the hard stuff. And the Scottish nectar can be tasted in all its infinite varieties at the Scottish Whisky Centre, tucked into the top end of the Royal Mile. To be honest, I'm not really interested in finding out how they make the stuff. It's like, I don't really want to know how they make chocolate, I just want to eat as much of it as possible whenever I can. Will actually be able to tell far more about a whisky from its bouquet than could ever be gathered by taste alone. So the thing to do is listen politely to the 3D hologram. Don't, whatever you do, flinch at the waxworks. And bide your time till you get to the tastings. If you're a whisky snob, you'll turn your nose up at the blended jobs that they serve down the local pub. And only let the single malt slip down your thrapple. That's local slang for throat, by the way. If you've got the merest soupçon of Scottish blood in your veins, you have to come and get your clan tartan knocked up into a kilt. Now, having married a man from the Stuart clan, I am fully entitled to wear the biscuit tin tartan. Although it has to be said that in traditional circles, venturing out in a mini kilt is practically a treasonable offence. But here at Geoffrey Taylor Kilt Makers, you can come out of the kilt closet. Howie Nicholsby at Jeffries is tartan fitter to rock and roll royalty. He's had them all in here. Sean Connery, Robbie Williams, Mel Gibson. And you don't just give them a few yards of pleating and a pie bowl sporran, do you, Howie? I mean, this is art. Yeah, I would consider it an art form. You know, the kilt makers have a lot of training to do. And if a customer wants a kilt, they've made a decision in their mind that they want to wear a skirt for a man, basically. Because a kilt... There is a lot of yardage to it. I mean, a woman wouldn't wear this much material, such heavy buckles. Do the purists ever get upset about what you're doing? The kilt originally was an everyday piece of clothing, so I'm trying to make it an everyday piece of clothing again. So I don't see how a purist can complain about that. When you take away the tartan like that, isn't there a danger that a lot of men will just think, I'm wearing a skirt? 
So it's all about you know having that confidence to try something different and realise that these are for men. There's you know there's no shame in giving it a go. And how much would one of these cost? Well, cost-wise, they vary. I mean, they start at 200 pounds, which can give you sort of a range of different fabrics that are quite easy going, up to 300 for a traditional one, which you know is an investment. And then something like what I'm wearing is about 600 pounds. Real leather one's about a thousand. So you know, there's a massive reach. But every kilt's an investment, really. It's about what you want to wear it for. Halfway down the Royal Mile is the High Kirk of St Giles, where a lot of historians think the English Civil War started. In 1637, the government in London tried to introduce the English prayer book to Scotland. Well, a local storeholder called Jenny Geddes got so upset with the preacher that she threw the pew at him. And the next thing you know, there's an almighty punch-up, rebellion. He said going to church was dull. The Queen's official residence in Scotland isn't Balmoral, it's Holyrood House. This is where Mary, Queen of Scots, spent 16 years of her life in two tiny rooms at the top of this tower. It was here her secretary and close friend, David Rizzio, was brutally murdered by her drunken husband, Lord Darnley. He apparently stabbed Rizzio 56 times in front of her and then dragged his body through her bedroom. And the place must still be a bit of a mess because even though tourists are allowed inside, our cameras aren't. In Edinburgh, like most capital cities, the history is laid on pretty thick. But here the aim is to warm you up for the main event. Yes, you'll be gagging for some bagpipe music and a swirl of sporran. Welcome to Scottish Night at the Prestonfield House Hotel, where the spirit of Andy Stewart lives on. <laughs> Actually, I'm not being very fair because there are some really naff venues serving up haggis and pipes in this part of the world. And this hotel, just two miles from the city centre, puts on quite a tasteful show. because, uh, quite honestly, if I carried on much longer, I think it would have been Donald, where's your trousers, and the gay Gordons. Although I can't deny there is something about a man in a skirt. Accommodation in Edinburgh is as mixed as in any other city, the surprise being that there are a lot more contemporary options than you may think. This is the Apex International, and a recent refurbishment has brought it slap bang into the 21st century. Yes, there are the traditional monoliths like the Balmoral or Caledonian, but there's choice too. My advice to anyone pondering their hotel options is to book, 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 particularly in the summer months. Remember, this is the UK's third most popular destination with overseas visitors. And in August, when the festival lets rip, well, just bring a tent. Coming up after the break, a night on the tune. My favourite a visit to the pub and the private lives of the royals at sea. want is a mortgage linked to your pension. No, no, no. You need to make sure it's capped to base rate. No, no, no. They're switching mortgage. They want an interest-only tracker like ours. Don't listen to him. <sighs> There's so many mortgages to choose from. No, I went to Direct Line. They did it all over the phone and their rates are great. We calculate interest daily and paying a bit extra monthly could save you thousands in interest. Call 0800 092 9696. Get a personal illustration to see exactly what our great discounted rates could do for you. Call 0800 092 9696. That's 0800 092 9696. For a great deal with your moving home or moving mortgage. It's little wonder that Greece still remains your favourite destination. Should your interest be lying poolside or perhaps exploring the Acropolis, Argo Holidays offers the pleasure seeker every option imaginable. Whether it's the idyllic settings, family-friendly atmosphere or the mouth-watering cuisine, a trip to Greece will allow you to leave your daily troubles behind. So if you want to visit Greece and its islands, call Argo Holidays on 0870 066 7070 or visit our website. Quality is our difference. Before you buy car insurance from just anyone, just keep asking yourself one question. Could I get a better deal with the AA? 
because last year the AA could have saved you up to £199 on your car insurance. Why not see what you could save? Before you buy car insurance from just anyone, just ask. Call 0800 444 or buy online. Your conservatory can look good and feel good all year round, thanks to Thomas Sanderson Conservatory Blinds. Individually made to fit any shape or size of window, reducing heat in summer and retaining warmth in winter. You can choose from over 200 colours and fabrics, as well as the world's most advanced remote control options. A free home presentation from your local Thomas Sanderson designer will give you expert advice on how to transform your conservatory, creating a look that's exactly right. Call now and we'll send you our free conservatory style guide, packed with ideas and colour schemes. Call Thomas Sanderson on 0800 083 6111. Beautiful conservatory blinds. For easy to use sun protection that dries in seconds, use Calypso Dry Oil Spray. Calypso, sun care for all the family. You've got something incredibly important to do. Where are you going to do it? With a laptop powered by Centrino, Intel's mobile technology and a wireless enabled home, you can connect to the world all over the house. Maybe even outside the house. Intel Centrino Mobile Technology. Edinburgh's A-list animal is this Sky Terrier, Greyfriars Bobby, famous for his faithfulness. He's reckoned to have lain for 14 years on his master's grave in Greyfriars Church before he finally died. It's a lovely story and one that spawned a whole industry of movies, books and tea towels. And I'm sure the fact that the ladies at the bakery over the way there fed him every day had nothing at all to do with his desire to stay here. Of course, the sentimentalists are saddened that dear Bobby couldn't join his master, but as a mere mutt, he had to be buried in unconsecrated ground. The Scots have a reputation for heavy drinking, and indeed for drinking heavy. Heavy is, of course, a generic term for beer, as in, gear's a pint of heavy there. Historically, Scotland's always had much laxer licensing hours than the rest of the UK. The pubs will stay open about one in the morning. But there are places now south of the border that can hold their own with them drink for drink. Except, of course, at Hogmanay or New Year, when Edinburgh becomes the capital of world-class alcohol consumption. For the rest of the time, pubs are very much part of the scene. This is a classic, the Ensign Ewart, thought to date back to the 17th century, serving everything to see you from door to floor, and a serious bit of bar grub as well. It's been said in the past that eating out in Edinburgh was overpriced and underwhelming. And as with so many other parts of the UK now, it's a bit of a cliché to say it, but all that's changed. Yes, Edinburgh's a much better dining destination than it was ten years ago. But even then, there was the witchery. For 22 years, an Edinburgh institution where lavender ladies have lunched and the rich and famous have dined. They did actually burn witches near here in the 16th and 17th centuries. And if you get a waft of roasting, you can be sure it's still local produce. Cured and roasted salmon, mounds of Scottish crustacea and Aberdeen Angus are all classic witchery fare. And the diners have been pretty tasty too. Michael Douglas, Jack Nicholson, Ewan McGregor, Pierce Brosnan, they've all sat in here. Which, for my money, has got to be one of the most fantastic dining rooms I've ever seen. The witchery may be Edinburgh's gastronomic granny, but that's not to say there aren't a few feisty youngsters around. This place is really something. I'm at the tower and quite literally on the tower of the Museum of Scotland, which has got some fantastic views over the old town. The tower restaurant is four years old and one of a breed of glossy contemporary eateries to hit the city. Edinburgh has restaurants to suit all budgets, but it's important to bear in mind that there's some serious top draw nosh to be had here. This is sea trout and Thai fish cake. Yes, it is possible to splash out without having the traditional cholesterol crazed Scottish fare land in your lap. I may never walk the streets of Edinburgh safely again, but I think it's fair to say that Glasgow actually has the edge on nightlife. But that's not to say that Edinburgh has nothing to offer at all. Good evening. Hi, thanks very much. 
It's all a matter of degrees. The city has some great bars and clubs. This one, the Opal Lounge, is at the cutting edge of Edinburgh nightlife. Very popular, very in. In the midst of all Edinburgh's ancient architecture, there's this startlingly modern building, the National Museum of Scotland. It got a bit of stick from the locals, but I think it's stunning. Because yes, it's modernist, but this great tower harks back to all those medieval jobs. And who'd have thought you could get sandstone in so many different shades? Alongside all the more traditional stuff in glass cases, they also try to show off the history of Scotland in as interesting a way as possible. So here's a fun idea. Everyday objects in the 20th century that various celebrities and members of the public reckon represent the age. So the city's famous son, the actor and former milkman, Sean Connery, chose a milk bottle. Tony Blair picked a guitar. And Newsnight's Kirsty Walk went for a Saab convertible. Hmm, hardly an everyday object in most people's lives. In a building reminiscent of London's Millennium Dome, this is Edinburgh's latest tourist attraction, the Dynamic Earth, which turns geology into an educational thrill ride. It kicks off with the Big Bang and doesn't let up over 15 billion years. When they show you a volcano, the floor really shakes and you get to smell the sulphur. And if you want to experience the chill of Antarctica, they fill a room with what feels like sub-zero temperatures, the sounds of creaking ice walls, and then slap bang right in the middle of it, a great big dollop of iceberg. And yeah, it is real. I have to say that this is one of the best educational attractions that I've ever seen. They present information in such an exciting way. Quite honestly, museums could come here and look and learn. And if all museums were like this, then your kids would be begging to be educated. So I'd definitely put this top of your tourist trip parade. The highlight for a lot of the terminally curious and downright gossipy is the Queen's old mobile holiday home, the Royal Yacht Britannia, now moored in the snazzy Terence Conran-designed Ocean Terminal down in Leith Harbour. There's a visitor centre, and in case you think the locals need to upgrade their mobile phones, these are audio guides you can hire that will take you through the history of the ship. It's fascinating having a poke round the place where Chas and Di spent their honeymoon, and the Queen said she felt at her most relaxed. You do feel like a nosy parlourmaid snooping around while the masters are out. And I have to say, I think the 1950s furniture is a touch dowdy. It's fun, though, to think of all the famous bottoms that have sat on those seats. Nelson Mandela, Indira Gandhi and Bill Clinton, to name but three large fromages. But the most revealing thing is that the Queen and Prince Philip had single beds in separate bedrooms. If you come here on a windy day and you're wearing something flowing, then uh, this is a great place to stand because the Queen had this built as a sort of modesty rail so that if the west wind blew, her skirt wouldn't end up in the Azores and leave her exposed in the stern. Edinburgh's proximity to the sea should be the perfect excuse to take a jaunt out of the city centre. This is North Berwick, one of a string of outstandingly beautiful beaches just three quarters of an hour from the city centre. Hanging on the cliffside is what remains of Tantallon Castle, built by the powerful Douglas family in the 14th century. In the background is the Bass Rock, a great wedge of basalt that's been a prison, a fortress and a monastic retreat. Now it's a bird sanctuary. There are terns, puffins, guillemots and an army of gannets. This is Big Brother with birds. There's not a seagull or a shag that can escape being spied upon by an impressive array of secret cameras. For all its electricery, unless you've got that voyeuristic fascination with tits and turns, there'll come a point at which you're quite desperate to turn away. Oh, I wish 
she wouldn't do that. Although there's no denying there's something distinctly eerie about Edinburgh late at night, particularly around the old town. Though it shouldn't come as too much of a surprise because it was round here that the infamous Burke and Hare lured their victims to their deaths and then sold their bodies for medical experiments in a few quid. The result is a whole ghost tour industry. There are enough ghastly deeds in the city's past to justify waking the dead after dark. The guides dress like one of the undead, which probably means she'll have a great career in breakfast television ahead of her. Mary Brewster came up the stairs. She took the key from the young couple, opened the door and went in, closing the door behind her. Ah! Came the great scream from inside the unfriendly room. The couple burst in. Mary, Mary, what is it? What's wrong? What's in here? A lot of these tours are just a kind of primal scream therapy, but this one's actually stuffed with gory yarns. The blade had got rather dull as it screeched through the bone. Nearly the finger was loose, almost. When ah! the woman sat up in her coffin and gave a yell. A yarn too far, perhaps, for sensitive souls. I feel like having a real good laugh now. A few years ago, they ran a campaign saying, Glasgow's miles better. And the joke was that Edinburgh's should have been Edinburgh's slightly superior. Well, there's definitely more to Scotland's capital city than tartan and shortbread. They've got world-class attractions, top drawer restaurants, and enough bars to quench even a Scotsman's thirst. And who could resist a city with a castle in the air? Now for some tips to help you plan a trip to Edinburgh. Don't bet on the weather, it's changeable and rarely hot even in summer when temperatures average 18 degrees Celsius. An umbrella is essential. And now for some costs. Admission to Edinburgh Castle is £8.50. A Scottish night at the Prestonfield House Hotel, including dinner, costs £33. And ghost tours start from £6. For more information, contact the Edinburgh and Lothians Tourist Board on 0131 473 3900 or visit their website. And we flew to Edinburgh from London Gatwick with EasyJet. Return flights start from £50. We stayed at the Apex International Hotel. Double rooms start from £90 per night. We'll see you again very soon. The Travel Bug explores Tunisia next Friday at 8. If you're up for it, next we are. Take treks in a wild world through Colorado. At British Gas, we only install boilers that pass our 87 point quality check. If they can't, we drop them. Call British Gas now on 0800 754 754 and we'll give you £100 off a brand new boiler. Are you one of the thousands of people who would like to raise some money? Perhaps to start your own business, but you've been knocked back because you've no proof of income. Maybe to buy your council house, but you have CCJs. You'd like to reduce your monthly credit card and loan bills, but you have arrears. You need to buy your ex's half of your home after a split. Your bank has turned you down. You want the money for home improvements, but you can't afford the monthly payments. An APS remortgage could be the way forward. If you want convenience without forms to fill in and no references taken, step forward. If you need the money quickly, Come to us. If you need one lower monthly payment, walk this way. If you're a homeowner and need a remortgage for any purpose, call APS. APS, moving forwards. If you're looking for a low rate personal loan, Alliance and Leicester have set their rate at, wait for it, 6.9%. Let me put that into perspective for you. 6.9%. Now that's low. Lower than Barclays? Lower than NatWest? Lower than Lloyd's TSB. Lower than HSBC. So, if you borrowed £7,500 over five years, 
Just look at what you could save. Call Alliance and Leicester today on free phone 0800 056 1525 for a quick decision on a low rate loan. 6.9%. Now that really is low. Alliance and Leicester 0800 056 1525. With 9,000 years of history, Cyprus offers an unparalleled experience. Thanks to Argo Holidays, you can explore this stunning island, safe in the knowledge that our first-class service will provide you with unforgettable memories at an unbelievable price. Argo Holidays are independent Cyprus specialists and pride ourselves on an exceptional service. To find out more, call 0870 443 7007. Quality is our difference. Call British Gas now on 0800 754 754 and we'll give you £100 off a brand new boiler. Don't forget your passport or you won't get to Egypt in half an hour and see the tombs of the pharaohs. Before that, West Virginia and Colorado are cool in treks in a wild world. Up for it on the Travel Channel. I'm here to explore the wild and wonderful state of West Virginia. I'm going to be rafting two of its great rivers. One is the New River, 900 feet below this bridge. The other is the Gauley. Also in this episode, Holly Morris goes bushwhacking in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains in Colorado. Every autumn, West Virginia becomes a rafter's mecca. That's when a million tons of water is released out of the Summersville Dam and into the Gauley River. October in West Virginia is known as the Gauley season. West Virginia lies 300 miles west of Washington, D.C. Starting on the New River, I'll head over Class 3 and 4 rapids, stopping off to see the site of the old abandoned settlement of Seward. From there, I'll head over to the Gauley River, near the Summersville Dam, where my task is to raft its Class 5 whitewater. I'm here in West Virginia. We're about to hit the New River. This is Terry, my guide. She's gonna show me the ropes. Ugh. Jack is the third member of our crew. He's been rafting these rivers for 14 years and knows a lot about the local history. So this is the second oldest river in North America. Why do they call it the New River? Uh, that's actually a pretty long story. <laughs> we, got time. we got time. <laughs> <laughs> so Nothing but time. The early explorers from the New River Valley, uh, this was a brand new river to them because it ran in a different direction. It ran north instead of all the rivers they'd seen that ran south. So they thought that it was the Northwest Passage. They thought they'd found it. 